We are joined now by the man with the best office view in all of college football, new Washington coach, Jed Fish. How are we doing, Jed? I'm doing good, my man. It is beautiful here. I can tell you that. The views are just incredible. Well, now I know you've you've probably seen a lot of your office because you, you you take this job, and obviously they were just playing the national championship game. But the team you inherit is going to look awfully different from that team. So what 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 have you got to do in terms of figuring out who on this roster can play over the next few months? Yeah, uh, I think we're at I think twenty of twenty two um, starters are gone. Um, which is which is pretty incredible. All eleven on offense <clears throat> are gone, and then nine uh, on defense are gone. And uh, so we've got to figure out really who we are as a team. We got to figure out what we want the program or the team to look like. Uh, I, I think it's so rare that you're looking at a spot where you have five offensive linemen all gone, where you have what. Arguably, could be a first-round quarterback, first-round receiver gone, second and third-round receivers gone, um, the whole defensive front gone. Um, so it's spring ball for us. We're going to push it back. We're going to start in April and uh, play our spring game May, in May and see like how long we could use this amount of time for the weight room, for the two-hour meeting, the you know two hours a week of football, and just try to get it going a little bit and get to know the kids, use occasional meals and do some things. So. Uh, we have about 74 scholarship players right now. And then um, after that, we'll we'll figure out how we can add in in the spring portal. How different is this situation from taking over to Arizona? Arizona, you took over a team that had gone 0-12, but there were returning starters. There were guys who had played in the in the program. Is it more of a clean slate here than, than there, I guess? Yeah, you know, I think the difference is when we got to Arizona in a hundred years, they only won 10 games three times. And when we took over Arizona, they were coming off of a nine touchdown loss um, against the rival. And we had about 10 or 11 returning starters on that team. We were trying to figure out who wanted to play football, who wanted to be a part of it. We were, didn't have a recruiting class. We had no freshmen in that first year. Um, we were kind of trying to figure it all out at once. This time around, we're taking off a team that played in the national championship game, went 14 and one the year before, played in the Alamo Bowl, which we played in Arizona last year, and trying to figure out exactly like, what does this team look like? Who are these guys? And, you know, why didn't they play? Because there's a lot of talent out here. They just had an extremely, extremely talented older football team. Um, Michael Penix was in his sixth year of college. You know, a lot of those guys were a part of three head coaching staffs with Chris Peterson, Jimmy Lake, and Coach DeBoer. So it's a, just a completely different program in that regard. I think Washington in itself has a huge name recognition. Um, one of the few Pac-12 teams that won a national championship, I think them and USC. And now we're entering into the Big Ten. So now <clears throat> not only are we building a, a new team with new players, but we're building it in a new conference. So how, how much of the, the Big Ten shift is on your mind daily? I mean, it, it's in, you weren't at Washington, but you were at a Pac-12 program. And if you'd stayed at Arizona, you'd be shifting to the Big 12. So you were going to do this one way or the other. But, but how much of it is trying to familiarize yourself with new opponents that you're going to see every year? Yeah, I mean, every day. <clears throat> every day we talk about the Big Ten. Every day we talk about who we're competing with, some of the games that we have coming up, the rematch against Michigan, the go to Penn State in November, the, you know, play a game in New Jersey on the East Coast, go to Iowa, <coughs> Kinnick Stadium, and be a part of that. We have, um, we talk about the fact that we still have USC, we still have Oregon, we still have UCLA. The monster games on the schedule, the Apple Cup still, uh, but playing at week three rather than week 12. So you've got all these games that you have to deal with and handle of opponents that you're not familiar with. And then you have to, on top of that, recognize you're playing in a, you know, when you go to Penn State, which I did when I was at Michigan, you're going to 105,000 people stadium that are probably all dressed in white. You know, they're probably got the whole white out going for that game in November. I would assume it'll be insane. I would guess. Um, 
the national championship rematch here in Seattle, um, playing some of these games in, you know, neutral game. We're playing against Washington State in the Apple Cup. There's so much to it that um, it, it's just a fascinating time to be in college football. And as we know, when you're in the Big Ten, uh, these games are going to be all over television. They're going to be slapped all over the noon, the three o'clock, the one o'clock, the four o'clock kicks. Uh, they'll be everywhere and anywhere. And uh, the fact that we got this this huge opportunity is uh, just incredible. So how different is college football from when you took over at Arizona? Because it's one thing I, I talked to you about this when you were at Arizona you know, you came in just as all this stuff was changing. So you kind of came in with a fresh perspective on it. But now you've been in it. How different are things now versus three years ago? Oh, my God. Well, you know, I, I, I made the comment that when I got hired at Arizona, <clears throat> NIL didn't come up. Transfer portal didn't come up. And uh, none of the conversations had anything to do with, let's call it player acquisition outside of recruiting. And none of the conversations had to do with all of the other factors that have to do with conference realignment and CFP. and None of those things were addressed. Uh, we were really talking about starting over at Arizona. We uh, were talking about how are we going to build our team with a high school class? And that's kind of what our expectation was. And then things just started happening quickly um, in that first year, year and a half. We didn't even make a move on the roster to use the head coach exemption. We didn't, there wasn't one player that we got rid of uh, that was on scholarship. This time around, it's completely different. I mean, even to the point of injunctions are coming in on a day-to-day -day basis of collectives being able to talk to players and player agents. Um, the idea of, you know, the, the constant conversations regarding how are you gonna recruit? Are you gonna spend your time focused on a high school recruiting, which is I'm, I'm a huge believer in. I'm not changing that mentality. Um, I just think that the best way to develop a culture is through um, taking high school kids, recruiting them, getting to know them, getting to know their families and building the program with them. But understanding that now there's this supreme sense of urgency of win now, and you can't just pass up on great players. So you have that combination of both going. Um, it's a constant change and it's a totally different group of teams that we're playing with that when you're university of Washington in the PAC 12, you can get in on every single player on the West coast. You're now university of Washington in the big 10, you know, have to, you have to resell your brand. You have to make sure people recognize what Washington football is outside of California, Hawaii, Washington, let's call it, the Vegas area and Arizona. We got to sell this Washington brand nationwide now if we're going to play four games on the East Coast. So in Arizona, the, the the cornerstone of what made your team so successful last year is that 2022 class. The the first class you signed when you had a full cycle and and like you said, high school kids that you developed. How do you strike that balance now? You know, how do you how do you make those decisions? Because I talked to Lane Kiffin about this the other day, and he was talking about how much more critical evaluation is. And it's not it's not like you have two decisions. It used to be your decision was, do I offer this person a scholarship or do I not offer this person a scholarship? Now it's like, do I offer this person a scholarship or where do they slot in on all of this? Like, how can I get two good years out of them if I take them as a transfer? Like, how, how do you strike the balance? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it was a very different time in 2022, which was uh, way back to two years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, one of the things that what we did is at the same time we brought in Noah Fafita, we brought in Jaden Delora through the transfer portal. The same time we brought in uh, Tetero McMillan, we brought in Jacob Cowan through the transfer portal. The, the same time we were, you know, talking to Mike Wiley about not transferring was the same time we were signing Jonah Coleman. Mm -hmm. The same time Jordan Morgan was developing, we were bringing in um, uh, Jonah Savanea. The same time that, so, you know, even, and you keep going down the list, Tanner McLaughlin as a transfer, Kean Burnett as a freshman. So 
while we were developing or while we were building our freshman class, we were bringing in what I would consider top notch players for our junior and senior class. And the idea was going to be that while that wall, our freshmen were going to move the program to a spot where we always dreamt of it being, which ended up being a 10 win season last year, the people that came in the portal were going to allow that to occur. Mm -hmm. I didn't think we'd win 10 without winning five the year before. I didn't think we could win five the year before without having really elite transfers come in. And that's kind of how it all balanced itself out. I think we have to do the same thing here. We have to make this class of 25 elite, elite. We have to go as, as big as we can go, sign 28 players from the freshman class, do everything we possibly can, and plug areas of need uh, with transfers and see where, you know, where that all falls. And I think that is kind of how our program is going to get built. And that's how you could have sustained success. So your staff's a mix of, of guys with college and NFL experience. Uh, Steve Belichick is your defensive coordinator. We last saw him on the Patriots sideline. Obviously, we know who his dad is. Uh, but he's been in the NFL. He's never had to uh, to, to recruit. I, I heard him talking on, on Chris Long's podcast about face FaceTime and a high school kid for the first time. And like, what's that like when you get these guys in who've been in the NFL and you're like, okay, so this is in a, this is NIL, but we need them to sign an NLI for like, how much of that do you have to, to get out of the way first? Uh, Steve's great. Steve's like, what acronym is this again now? What is this acronym you guys are talking about? Uh, we have an academic meeting going on, but uh, you know, first of all, you gotta be a great football coach. That, that's the number one prerequisite for us hiring uh, a coach at Washington. You better be a good coach. You better have shown your ability to um, make players better and develop players. That's why hiring Steve was a coup in some regard and a huge win for our program and others. He called the defense for four years at the Patriots. In those four years, it was the number one total defense over a four year span. Um, Yes, he's coached in the NFL 12 years. Prior to that, he was a college student at Rutgers um, <laughs> as a long snapper for Greg Shiano. And what I think we got from Steve is we've got this ability to be able to put a system in that we know is going to work. And then recruiting is not difficult. Recruiting just takes time. And if you have guys that really work hard and are committed to working hard, anybody can recruit. It's just the want to to work hard. Vinny Sinceri, well, you know, he came. I brought in Vinny Sinceri um, mm -hmm. as well from the NFL, but Vinny's dad is one of the most. Sal. Well yeah. He's one of the well most well known college coaches there is. So Vinny grew up in it. Vinny saw his dad recruit with maps and pay phones and <laughs> everything. And now to cell phones and now to laptops, to iPads, to text messaging. Um, so I wasn't worried at all in that regard, but I wanted great ball coaches. And then, uh, we brought in Robert Bala, um, from Alabama and he was a linebacker coach for Nick Saban. So I felt very confident that he understood that, but yet he was from the West coast from Oceanside. And then everyone else I brought, uh, I coached with at Arizona. They were all on our staff for three years each. So we brought 21 staff members from Arizona, um, and came and joined our program here, and we really built it the way we wanted it. It now, especially because so much recruiting is done through the portal, does that also change what you are looking for in a recruiter? Because I would think the the NFL experience that this is how we can prepare you for the league piece of it becomes very important to those transfers, especially. Whereas you still need the guys who know all of the high school coaches, who know all of the trainers in an area, who can call, hey. I, I got a I got a kid who's a freshman in, in high school who's going to be amazing in three years. Like, you, you you need both of those things now. Yeah, you do. Um, I don't know one trainer, and I don't know one seven on seven coach, and I don't really. I, I've never been able to really recruit that way myself because I felt like I've been when you go back and forth from the NFL to college, you don't really build those same relationships. So it's critical that certain coaches on our staff have great ties and have only coached in college football. John Richardson, Kevin Cummings, Jason Kafusi, Jimmy Doherty. Um, those guys, Jordan Powell, 
those five guys have only coached in college ball and they know everybody. Um, and they know really what it looks like. And I always lean on them of like, hey, where do you see this guy, you know, developing into in year two, year three? Matt Doherty, our director of player personnel, Josh Moore, Amora, our director of recruiting. Those two guys know exactly what we want. They've been with me for Matt over seven years, Josh three years going on four, and they know exactly what we want our program to look like. But then with those five, then you've got Brennan Carroll, Steve Belichick, Vinny Sinceri, Scotty Graham, <clears throat> uh, and myself that have all coached in the NFL. Um, Robert Bala, I mentioned uh, earlier, and he would be our six. But the other five of us have all coached in the NFL. And our experiences are more along the lines of, okay, what does a player personnel department look like? What does a director of pro scouting do? What does a director of college scouting do? How do we correlate those jobs to our program? And then how do we make sure that we're making wise decisions on, you know, measurables? Uh, really, we talk about how does this guy help our team today? Bill Parcells used to always say, don't bring in a free agent that gets, um, that's your highest paid player because you have a split locker room right away. So you got to be very aware of that as you're bringing in transfers. Uh, our goal is not to have a split locker room. Our goal is to build a great locker room with the mix of college and pro players. I was going to say, how much does having that experience help deal with all this new stuff, which is not new stuff to people in the NFL? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, for us, uh, one of the things that I've said is that we don't have to sell them on the NFL. We tell them about the NFL because combined we're over 80 years of NFL experience. Uh, when you bring in guys that have all, you know, been in, raised in the league, uh, even – our defensive graduate assistant, it's John Lynch's son, yeah. so who played at Stanford. So he's been raised in the league. He's been raised in not just being having a dad as a player, but then also as an evaluator. Um, when you have Luke Del Rio, who's moved around and been with his dad, who's been a longtime NFL head coach and coordinator. Yeah, you're it's, just a Gator stacking Gators there. We, we, we that know how that Gator goes. stacking Gator. That is that. Yeah. That, that is true. Um and, and you do that and you bring those guys in, they know what it looks like. And they can have those conversations with the kids and they can say, hey, this is how we do it. This is what the program is going to look like. This is how it's going to work. And uh, we can tell you that when you sit in the draft room, this is what they're looking for. And this is what they want. And you can either hear someone tell you that from what they've been told before, or you can tell them that because you lived through it. And uh, we hope that, that the latter is what people want to listen to. Now, one of your quarterbacks, Will Rogers, started four years at Mississippi State, play, uh, had, had come to play for Kalen, went looked around. He's, he's back with you. It's interesting because you played him the last two years. So I imagine you got a, a pretty good level of familiarity with him. No doubt. As an SEC homer like yourself, you definitely have a much better go. familiarity than I do with him. <laughs> but, uh, we did play. Uh, we played against him twice. Um, we we played better the second time than we did the first time. Um, obviously, it was two different staffs when he was with Coach Leach. Uh, he had incredible production. I think he has close to 1,900 attempts, 12,000 yards. Um, he started a ton of football games. It was really important that we brought in a veteran quarterback because we also brought in Demond Williams. And Demond mm -hmm. Williams was committed to us at Arizona. And uh, this kid is elite, 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 elite talent. Um, he's got everything that you want in a player from a GPA. You know, I said your GPA and your 40 time is about the same, like four, <laughs> four. Uh, it's unbelievable. And he's just, um, he's special in a lot of ways. So to have Will help mentor Demond through this process is going to be enormous. We were able to uh, hold on to uh, Marmar, uh, who was committed to coach the board staff and was a true freshman when he walked in the door in January. So we got a nice little quarterback room going, um, but Will's going to be a huge part of what we're trying to get accomplished. And I saw it right in front of me. So it, this is it, all about this is, is weird. Cause you, I realized like you signed a class at Arizona before you wind up leaving that, they signed a class at Washington before they left. How is how strange is that to walk into? You've got yeah. a full class here. You're not you're not even trying to scramble to recruit a class. 
Yeah, it's really, really different. Um, but nowadays, you know, they can get out of their, their what is it, NLI or NIL? NLIs. NLI, yeah. I think about, I don't know the exact number. I think we ended up signing about 10 guys that were committed and signed with us at Arizona, got out of their um, NLIs and came to us. Um, I think about 10 guys or eight guys that signed with Washington, got out of their NLIs and went elsewhere. I know probably four or five of them went to Bama and then a few others went to some other programs. Uh, It's just the world we're living in right now. So often these players are committing to the coaching staff and there's just not enough time in a short period of time to regrow their trust or build their trust so quickly. Um, A lot of times you recruited the same players and they chose, you know, a, a staff or a head coach or a program over another program. And then all of a sudden their guy's not there anymore. So now they're just going to go with them. And um, that makes a lot of sense to me. I never fought any player uh, that came to me and said they wanted to go in the portal or that they were going to go to Alabama or they were going to transfer there. I get it. I, I am encourage it in some regard that they needed to feel comfortable in their college career. Otherwise they'll want to transfer in April. So well, um, the sooner the better is what I was saying to them. Yeah. And you get the guys who want to be with you and, and guys you've ID that you want. I, I, I did hear you say something about that during the job change, which just fascinated me because I, I'm always amazed about how little face to face time and how little time elapses in these coaching searches, which are for huge jobs, CEO jobs that, that you know, you're, you've got yeah. huge staffs, tons of money involved. <clears throat> You got two hours to decide if you were taking this job. Yeah. What are those two hours like? Um, well, stressful uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, you almost, you, you, you start fighting with yourself of saying, is it easier to say no? Is it easier not to move? Is it easier to just go with, okay, I'm comfortable and, you know, almost, take the easy way out in a lot of ways. Um, And then you start realizing all of the potential and the upside. And as I like to say, I'm going to work just as hard wherever at at that job versus this job. So if I'm going to work just as hard, why would I not want to put myself in a position where we can be at a different level for the years to come? that we'll be able to have certain resources through the Big Ten multimedia rights. We'll have a certain schedule that, you know, is just hard to compete with when you're playing all of these elite teams and elite programs week in and week out. And uh, it was really hard. It's emotional. You try to, you make a lot of decisions based on, uh, you got to fight your brain with your heart uh, in a lot of ways. And then in the end, you, you just make a decision and your wife and kids, are on board with it and uh, or if they're not on board with it you can't make the decision and then uh you gotta go and they don't let you you know i've said it numerous times they just don't let you spend a lot of time talking about the why or the what or the who and you just gotta do it and we're very happy i hadn't thought about that till i heard you talking about that with with my pal ari wasserman like they they won't let you do that because they think it might be tampering which i had never thought about but i guess it makes sense but it sounds awful it is awful. It is awful. I mean, every time I get a text from a former player, I just have to, I write back the NCAA does not allow me to talk to you. So <laughs> that's really, that's a real uh, nice Brutal. thing to do. Um, yet in the NFL, you could be sitting there talking, you know, you could be on one team and you could talk to another quarterback or another guy that you coached and no one's wondering if you're tampering or not. I mean, there are some personal elements to, to this job that, you, you know, but it is what it is. It's the job that they've decided that it's what they've claimed that, is a way to avoid tampering. Um, and I guess they would say that I would stand up there in the room and I don't know how long you talk anyway. I saw Coach Saban uh, in the article I read yesterday said that he had a six minute team meeting to talk about um, his retirement. And he wasn't leaving for another school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our meeting, I, I guess, went four or five minutes. I don't know, something like that. Um, well, what, what, what else, else is there do? to say? I, I had to, I had to change jobs last year. I don't remember any of the conversations with my bosses lasting more than four or five minutes initially. Yeah. Cause I don't know what else, I don't know what else there is to say. Um, 
I think you start putting yourself in a bad position or a weird position if you talk too much. Yeah. And um, I mean, the situation was what it was. And then um, we had to move on and we had to start building our program in Seattle in the exact same manner that we built our program in Arizona. And that was a people first program. And you've got a lot of, of room to work. I mean, it's basically a clean sheet right now. So I, I imagine that's pretty exciting. 46 scholarship athletes when I got here, 46. So uh, <laughs> we were 39 scholarships short of the minimum, right? Or of the maximum. So we are now currently, I think, at 70. So okay. uh, we're, we're building up. We're building up to uh, the right number, but we, we have a lot of spots available um, come April. For those who might want to enter the spring transfer portal, the you know, it's a lovely view in Seattle. <laughs> it's a pretty good football. Touché, I need to shake. Yeah, no, it, well, and and they did just play for the national championship. There is that too. So, <laughs> well, Jed, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and uh, and, and good luck with uh, with the team on the field in April, and then uh, with with all the recruiting after April. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it, buddy. Good talking to you, man. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On 3 Sports YouTube channel.